This is the lecture for ancient medieval history for fr uh, Thursday, the 21st of April 2022. Word about Friday. Tomorrow we'll be going online. And you will be finding a lecture video and maybe some supplemental things. You're responsible for watching the entirety of what I give you before 2 o'clock and for making a paragraph-length unique comment on it in the public comment section of the Google stream where you will find it. If it is in on time and a good comment, you know, thoughtful, worthwhile, about a paragraph long, you'll get a 100% homework grade. If it is not sufficient, a uh, partial comment, a stub, sort of, I'm here, uh, you'll get a 40, which is an F. Um, if you get a good comment in late, after 2 p.m. tomorrow, but before 6 a.m. Monday, you will get a 66, which is a D. And if nothing comes in by 6 a.m. Monday, it's a zero, not to be able, not able to be made up. So, it is wise for you to take advantage of this very easy homework grade. There are not many homework grades during the fourth quarter. What that means is that this will count. It will cast a shadow over the fourth quarter grade. Since we have to do this lovely, not silly at all, not waste of my time at all, uh, stupid staff training day tomorrow, uh, you have to uh, watch the videos online. It's a virtual day. I'm going to be taking attendance by 2 o'clock or at 2 o'clock precisely, and it's going to be based on your comments. So get them in before 2, get a good comment in, earn a solid 100% for your grade, which will help you out. Any questions about tomorrow? Make sure you're going to be upset. So, we now come to a turning point in history. Up until now, the division between the Aryan Christian Germans and the Catholic Christian former Romans is such that it prevents the societies from cohering. However, <clears throat> During the 600s, the Merovingian Franks make a fateful decision that's going to make them the most powerful kingdom in Western Europe. What they're going to do is the Franks are going to become Roman Catholics. In fact, the Frankish kings are going to make an alliance with the Roman Pope. So, when this happens, the Franks are the very first of the Germanic tribes ruling over Western Europe to become the same denomination of Christian as the majority of people who live in Western Europe. What this is going to do is create a cohesiveness, a sense of unity between the ruler and the ruled, which is going to make the kingdom of the Franks more powerful, more effective than any of their competitors. Franks, uh, Frank Reich, the Frankish lands, what will later become France, is going to benefit from this long term because it begins developing earlier. The alliance with the Pope is going to be important also because it's going to create of the Frankish kingdom something something transcendent. The Lombards in the late 1700s, the pagans, the anti-Christians, the tribe that rules North Italy, is marching on Rome. They want to capture or destroy the Pope and the papacy, and in doing so, cripple the Christian faith in the West. So this is a serious threat. And the Pope sends out a request for aid to the King of the Franks, a man named Carl. King Carl of the Franks 
comes to the aid of the Pope. In coming to the aid of the Pope, he destroys the Lombard kingdom and adds it to the kingdom of the Franks. Now this is a special fellow, Carl. Not just an average run-of-the-mill guy. King Carl is an ambitious man. And he understands something about the people of his land. There is an existential depression about them. Why would they be depressed? Because they live in the shadows of the ruins of an ancient civilization greater than theirs. They live in the shadows of the ruins of a civilization that was able to build a road razor straight from one horizon end to the other. To build aqueducts that seem like roads in the sky. Again, from horizon to horizon. Whose ruined cities are the rock quarries at which we build our huts and hovels and walls and churches. The ancients, were they people? Were they men like us? Maybe they were giants. Maybe they were gods. Remember, the knowledge that we take for granted as history was pretty rare, especially among common people. The rulers understood there had been a realm called Rome, and it had covered all the known land, and they had been able to build cities of countless people. Buildings five stories tall. Walls thicker than a man is tall. Systems of water that could bring water from cool mountain lakes and streams to thirsty cities. That could bring in water that could be heated and made into baths. That could be used to take waste away. People who had knowledge that's died out. The sense of living in a fallen world is something I have difficulty explaining to you. Because you and I live in a country that has been in something like a golden age. And with all the problems that we face, we're still the center of a global society, a global network of trade, with technologies that can put men on the moon, put satellites in space, cure diseases like never before, connect us like never before for better or worse. The thought of living in the shadow of the ruins of your great-grandparents, great-grandparents is not within the realm of most Americans to be able to easily imagine. It's science fiction or fantasy. But that's what the people of Western Europe did. They literally sometimes lived in the shadow of the aqueducts or the roads, bridges, the cities, the walls, the great works of the mythical giants that came before the Romans. Carl wants to do more. He wants to bring hope to his people. Being a good Catholic Christian is one of those things. Carl is a very publicly devout fellow. He is famous for appealing to God by walking literally on his knees, praying every step up the steps of churches and later in an early cathedral. Asking for God's blessing and mercy, forgiveness and favor. All of this is going to lead to Carl conquering the Lombards for Frank, for the land of the Franks, and being in Rome for Christmas of the year 800. Good round number 800. Christmas, important day. 
When I was a kid and I read about this, I always pictured snow falling, but it's Rome. Probably no snow falling. Maybe rain. In any event, Carl is invited to the Pope's church. He probably knows what's going to happen, but he doesn't act like it. When he arrives, everyone's waiting for him, and he's asked to kneel. And the Pope coronates a man who's already been crowned King of the Franks, the Emperor of the Western Romans, the Roman Emperor in the West. This is the first Roman emperor in the West since Romulus Augustulus in 475. So we're talking 476, 324 years. And this is no weak little teenage boy at the mercy of his big, scary German bodyguard. This is a Germanic king, a Catholic king, king of the strongest kingdom in Western Europe, the protector of the church and of the pope, an ambitious man who wants to bring hope to his people. The word Roman carries such weight because it was those very Romans who built these great monoliths of stone that we see, that we live amongst, but we don't really understand. And if now our king is a Roman, What does that mean for us? King Carl is known to history as Carlus Magnus. Carlus Magnus, Carl the Great. In the French, Charlemagne. So we know him as Charlemagne. Not the internet character, Charlemagne the God. Because the real Charlemagne is a human being who worships God and doesn't claim to be. Just In any event, Charlemagne, on Christmas Day of the year 800, his accession to become the Roman Emperor in the West is going to be a symbolic, but a very important symbolic, turning point in the history of our civilization. Up until now, arguably, it's been a dark age that's been declining or holding its own somewhere down here. But now we have the aspiration to return to what was. But Christian, better. We, our civilization, the West, begins to think of itself as something other than the fallen offshoots of a once great people. Some Westerners even begin to say something in their minds like, we're back with confidence, with hope for the future. Coronation of Charlemagne as Roman Emperor is going to be, mean the establishment of what will last for a thousand years until... 1803, the Holy Roman Empire. Now, this is often called the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. The French philosopher in the 18, uh, 1700s, the 18th century, uh, Voltaire used to say of this, it's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. But when Karl is crowned the Western Roman Emperor, it's the beginning of something big. It's the beginning of a return to hope. Now, ultimately, the borders of Charlemagne's empire, it's a good color to use. Charlemagne temporarily controls things on the southern side of the Pyrenees. But basically, the Pyrenees Mountains are the southwestern border of Charlemagne's empire. Charlemagne also, while having good relations with the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Britain, doesn't rule them. 
So the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean are borders of his empire. Charlemagne is the protector of Rome, but southern Italy is not part of this. So Charlemagne's empire stops just south of Rome. Charlemagne's empire extends a little bit into the Balkans. And at first, its border is roughly along the Rhine River. But eventually, Charlemagne takes the land of the Saxons. So, you have an empire that Charlemagne either inherits or conquers that is going to include the modern nations of France, Western Germany, Northern Italy, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and parts of Slovenia and Croatia. <clears throat> it's the heart of Western Europe. Now, the conquest of the Saxons is a big deal in this. Charlemagne's armies move across the Rhine like a Roman imperial army, and they move towards the Elbe River. Between those two rivers in western Germany are the Saxons, a pagan confederation of tribes who are the ancestors of the rulers of England, who rule areas the Franks used to rule back hundreds of years ago, who are like primal Germans. They're not all civilized like the Franks and the others who inhabited Roman lands. They're real Germans. Charlemagne's armies crushed them. It's not an easy war. It's a long war. It's a very difficult war. But after about a decade of fighting, Charlemagne's armies <clears throat> crush the Saxons. And one of the key moments in this is that the major cult of the Saxons worship a holy oak. The oak tree is massive, looks sort of like a person, is considered to be a god, is considered to be the strength god of the Saxon people. And Charlemagne calls the leaders of the Saxons that he's captured to visit the Holy Oak with him. And anyone else who wants to come, and his army is there. It's a treat, dear God, right? Holy Oak. Holy Oak of the Saxons. Really? Sees you in chains, sees me, Christian. Not in chains, holding the key to your chains. You yeah, know, he's still our God. Okay. Chop it down and burn it. And that's what his army does. They chop down the holy oak, they burn it, and in doing so, Charlemagne is demonstrating something very simple that doesn't always work with religion. You don't always have the ability to take somebody's god, chop it to firewood, and make a giant uh, weenie roast out of it. Because people, if they really believe, will believe that the spirit of the tree will live on, and now you've made it immortal. It's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. You will cut me down, but I will be greater than you can imagine. Darn. But that is not what happens with the Saxons. Charlemagne gets it right. And in doing so, breaks the pa paganism of the Saxons and sets the stage for their conversion as a group to the Christian faith, which is a necessary component of being part of Western civilization. So Charlemagne has the uh, Saxons. Note in your notes, this is not listed there, Conquest of the Saxons. S-A-X-O-N-S. S-A-X-O-N-S. 
S A X O F S. Otherwise, in warfare, again, Charlemagne briefly rules a uh, territory to the south of the Pyrenees in Moslem Spain. They get driven out. And in one of the battles where the Frankish knights are being driven out of Spain, one of Charlemagne's paladins, one of his chief knights, the word paladin often is used to mean a holy warrior of a Christian faith. For example, in the legend of Sir Lancelot uh, and King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, uh, Lancelot is considered to be a uh, paladin. But the paladins of Charlemagne are his generals, his knight chieftains. And one of them is Roland. And Roland and his force is being pursued by a larger Muslim force across the passes of the Pyrenees. Roland tells his men, if we keep running, we're not all going to make it. He takes his sword Joyeuse out of its sheath wheels his horse around, orders his men to keep fleeing, and he personally charges and fights a hopeless battle to protect his men. The Song of Roland is a classic of French literature. It's their version of Beowulf. So write down The Song of Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D. The Song of Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D. Very important piece of literature. Ask Dr. LeBlanc about it. She probably has copies in both French and English. The Song of Roland. Of course he does. It's fine. This ghost will see you. That's fine. Thank you. Um, now, he's not just about war, Charlemagne, even though he expands this empire to include the heart of the West. France, Germany, Italy, all the areas in between. Charlemagne is also a man of letters. There are famous woodcuts from the Middle Ages. This works. Of Charlemagne sitting at a desk, struggling with his letters struggling with reading and writing really hard. Why? Is he stupid? <laughs> Dan, he could make me throw this at you. He could be dyslexic. He could be. But they didn't have dyslexia in those days. Because men were men, and women were women. And there was none of that stuff. You either did it or you didn't. Toughen up, buttercup. Dyslexia. Health problems. So you've got no legs. That don't mean you can't bounce around and march. You can hobble. Piss but a scratch. Piss but a flesh room. <laughs> so why is Charlemagne so troubled by this, this, this reading and writing stuff? Well, I'll tell you why. First of all, you presumably know how to read and write. And you probably learned when you were a small child. I learned before I went to kindergarten. Because my mom was a teacher. So she read me books. And uh, after a while, I learned the books. And I, I learned how to, that's how I learned how to read. Max, where the wild things are. It's a great one. I hope that you've read it. If you haven't, even as an adult, you, you should. They did, but I didn't care for it. I, I don't see a need to make a movie out of a great book. I didn't watch it. The movie I didn't was so like making a the movie. movie was it's like horrible. making a movie about the very hungry caterpillar. It's not. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Yeah. Well, at least they didn't make a movie called blood. Everybody Poops, which is another really great <laughs> children's book, or at least a best bestseller. I know this because we found it and we gave it to my nephew and his <laughs> babies. Uh, when the, they were kids. The movie for World of, where the Wild Things Are is horrible. It's <laughs> okay. all it I believe you. Right. I absolutely it's believe you. There's no it's question not. in my mind. It would be nothing can beat the imagination. So Charlemagne doesn't learn as a child. Charl yes. What about Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings is different. <laughs> and even then, they still have send out your war riders, which is stupid. 
And they don't include a bunch of things. that. They, but no, Lord of the Rings was wonderful. On the other hand, Lord of the Rings is the exception. Because then they did The Hobbit. And The Hobbit movies... And... In other words, in my personal opinion, they both suck and blow. I don't like them. I really don't. I love The Hobbit book... I'm talking about respiring here. <laughs> no, you said something. Don't say anything, man. I don't care. Just don't distract me. So, um, Charlemagne is. <laughs> I don't know if you agree about the Hobbit movies. You, you may like them. You may like the whole Lake Town discomfort thing. And oh, oh, oh Fury! What? Hey. Hey, 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 Toriel, who's not in the books anywhere or any anything. Toriel, um, fake elf woman. Um, what's your love's last name? Yeah. The dwarf? <laughs> Sorry, I got that from the video. But it is funny. Uh, she doesn't know. Interspecies romance. In any event, uh, elf dwarf. Why not well. troll? If you're going to go for that whole thing. Do they have trolls? Yes, they had trolls in Middle Earth. And trolls. Well, you see them in Lord of the Rings. You see them in Fellowship. Then you see them at the end also. And in the Hobbit movie, they had three trolls too. In any event, he's just a big stony bundle of joy. His name is Bach. <laughs> Charlemagne learns to read as an adult. God, this is abstraction. Now, your mind, such as it is, your mind does different things at different ages naturally. If we were serious about teaching people foreign languages, you would have learned French or Spanish or Latin or Greek or Chinese or German or Russian or whatever in K through 6. You would have learned it alongside English. Why? Because the human brain, between, say, the ages of 4 and 12, is really good at absorbing language. Bless you. That's when we really learn thank and you. develop our languages. I said thank you. So, we don't do that, do we? You just have English. So you've got to struggle, unless you happen to be talented linguistically with your uh, vocabulary and your grammar and all the other stuff and the weird little letter things that they have. The tilde, the umlaut, other things like that. Umlaut is for Germans, two little dots. Or no, it's a little carrot. In any event, Charlemagne learns as an adult, not as a child. That's hard. But wait, there's more. Because Charlemagne is not learning Frankish. That's the language he speaks. No, no one writes in Frankish. That would be like writing in the street gang patois of a bunch of hooligans from the Bronx. Yeah, they talk that way in that little neighborhood in the Bronx. Who cares unless they're rapping? Apparently people care then, but not me. In any event, you have Charlemagne, an adult. A king who wants to learn to read and write is a good example to his people. Learning to read and write, not in his own language, but in Latin. Yeah. An adult learning to read and write for the first time in a foreign language. Yes, Frankish is a combination of German and Latin. Sure, but it's not German or Latin. It's Latin. It, it, it's Frankish. It's a mixture. It's not the same language. You try. When you're in your 20s or 30s, picking up an entirely new language and an entirely new skill, not easy. So when Charlemagne is struggling with his letters, he is doing something that's genuinely difficult. He also makes a very important imperial order. He orders all of the books within his realm to be preserved and copied, if at all possible. Now, some people are going to do this on their own. Some people are going to bring their books to monasteries and get them back after they've been copied. But what Charlemagne wants to do is stop the hemorrhage of the knowledge, the arterial bleeding. Knowledge gone, knowledge gone, knowledge out of your body gone, blood pressure lowering, going to die because arterial bleeding. That's what's been happening. Now, 
Here's a scary thing. If you know anything about knowledge, you're caring about knowledge. I don't care. Well, enjoy digging dishes. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Actually, digging dishes is a good job. Pay as well. These days. They counted the number of books that Charlemagne was able to preserve in his lifetime. I'm not talking the actual number of different scrolls and folio books and things like that. I'm talking about the number of titles. The number of titles is smaller than the library at Coeur d'Alene High School or Lake City High School by a considerable amount. I'm not talking the Coeur d'Alene Library. I'm not talking Hayden Library. I'm not talking any of the big libraries, not the University Library down in Moscow. I'm talking the high school library at Coeur d'Alene or Lake City has significantly more book titles than existed in all of Western Europe in Charlemagne's time. That's how close the Western world came to having its own knowledge go out like a candle in the wind. Charlemagne's order helped stop that and changed the traje trajectory so that more books were uh, copied and because of his order, more books were found later, after his time. And we start getting books from the Arabs, and we start finding books in old castles. And... But Charlemagne's order is a turning point. If he had come along 80 years, 100 years, 120 years later, it's entirely possible that there would not have been a critical mass of books from the Greeks and Romans or early medieval peer people to preserve, that they would have just been gods. That's, to me, a scary book. But that's not all. Charlemagne wants trade. Yes? Uh, wasn't there a Chinese emperor who kind of just burned all the books? The story I'm familiar with, well, first of all, Qin Shi Huangdi, the first sovereign emperor of China, who's the role model for the communists, uh, was a mass murderer par excellence. And he did things like burn any books that he didn't agree with or that he thought violated his rule. One of the weird things is in the 1400s, the Chinese, about 50 years before Columbus, send out a treasure fleet to the Malay, Indonesian islands, and to the Indian Ocean. The empire is looking to see if there's anyone in the world worth talking to. And they go to Africa, and they go to the Arabs, and they go to India, and they don't find anyone as strong as they are. So basically they say, there's nobody out here worth talking to. They burn their fleet. All of it. They burn the books that describe the navigation they use. They burn the, the plans for the fleet. They destroy them because it's not necessary. Fifty years later, the Europeans start showing up uh, around their shores. Had they not burned their fleet, the history of the world might have been very different. But they did. Oh, by the way, you know the moon rocket, the Saturn V, a big rocket that we used to send men to the moon and back, a rocket capable of putting a heavy space station in orbit in one shot? That rocket? Apparently, the United States uh, and NASA destroyed the plans for the Saturn V in the early to mid-1970s to avoid the Russians getting a hold of the plans. So if that story is true, and it seems a little urban mythy to me, uh, we no longer have the plans for our own moon rocket. We will have to reverse engineer it and build it sort of from scratch. Don't we probably have better rockets now? Well, we have, so we have rockets with better thrust-to-weight ratios. We got those from the Russians, actually. They were, they were better at it than we were. But the Russians never built a working moon rocket. Every time they tried, they had an almost nuclear blast type explosion. We did. So there were things that we did that the Russians never learned how to. And in terms of raw power, the Saturn V had enough thrust, not only to get the heavy things off the Earth out of our own gravity well, but to shoot things into interstellar space. We have two probes, Voyagers 1 and 2, that have both left the solar system, and they left Earth on a Saturn V. That gave them the initial push. In any event, we burned our own ship. Smart. Smart Americans. Uh, Charlemagne builds a canal 
connecting the upper Rhine and the upper Danube rivers to build and boost trade in an area of, uh, sort of near modern Switzerland. We know where the canal is. It's an amazing work. Nobody in the Middle Ages does that in Europe, but Charlemagne, he's the only one. He has a monk from England named Alcuin of York. And Alcuin of York is Charle one of Charlemagne's educated advisors. He helps teach Charlemagne how to read and write. Uh, he encourages Charlemagne to learn about old Roman projects. And that's one of the things that gives him the idea of building this canal between the Rhine and Danube rivers. Um, and Charlemagne builds a uh, capital at what is today Aachen, Germany, what was then called Aix la Chapelle. And I'm going to show you some things about it. Will you shut the fan off, please? Close the shade. Will you please close the slats on that shade? Can you shut the lights, please? Thank you. Oh, did you? What? Do you have to pause the video? Oh, nah. I don't think so. Not for the pictures, anyway. If I start showing you a video, then I might. Uh, but for now, what I'm going to show you is what he built at Isle La Chapelle. <clears throat> Wait a second. I may be able to get this. I think there's an interactive version. And I only just remembered it. So, this. No. Still, that's part of the cathedral that uh, Charlemagne built at Isla Chapelle. Now, let me see if I can get. An interactive version. I know there's one of these for the Sistine Chapel. I seem to remember there being one uh, <laughs> for this. Not Wikipedia. TripAdvisor. <laughs> hey, it's Virtual tool. Valid source. Yeah. Hey, people spend thousands of dollars based on that. Well, that's nice. Okay, I don't care. So, here, no, always block. Here we are in the central baptistry looking up at this uh, cylinder. There's a lot of Alme symbols or whatever these swirly things are. Let's see if I can find a better version. This looks good. Are these big? I have big pictures. I want big pictures. Virtual 3D flight of Aachen Cathedral. Okay, let's see if this is what it is. Start your 3D experience here. Ooh. Ooh. Now let's, let's see. I didn't agree for their stupid cookies. I don't like cookies. <laughs> Except for chocolate chip or. No, I'm not going to subscribe. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Virtual 3D. I I can figure it out. Let me start the virtual tour here. Let's make it big. Well, let's start. Okay. So we're going in through the doors really fast. And note the arches and the colors of the arches. You've got columns, and then you've got arches up above. That's not fast or dizzying. No, not at all. Now we're in the central area. The Farbos Lutter. Okay, so we look up several stories, and there's that beautiful angelic ceiling. 
And there's Charlemagne in uh, picture four. four. This guy is Charlemagne. The Golden Palace. So we go down and we see the, the vase. This is kind of cool. And now, now we're over to the regular part of the cathedral. But it's that up and down part that is the really interesting thing to me. So you've got this area that's one, two, looks like three, four, five stories. In some ways, this is the tallest building that they built in Western Europe uh, up to Charlemagne's time. It's not as big or as grand as the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, but it's still pretty, pretty big and impressive. And what I would have you remember for your... Oh, that's the wrong one. If I was Charlemagne, I would have added another layer of large columns <laughs> on top. Uh, well, actually, they're lucky this thing didn't collapse because these people did not have access to advanced math. So what they had, they largely used. Okay. Oh, that's the same one. Now we're looking up. Okay, let's look up. We're looking straight up. Now, uh... As we look up, you see these arches uh, over the columns? They're sort of dark and white. If you recall the Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King, they make the steward's palace in Gondor in Minas Tirith have a similar pattern of white and black stones in these arched columns. And that's definitely based on uh, Charlemagne's... Um, Palace at Aachen or Isla Chapelle. So you got the first la layer, the second uh, level, the third story, and up here, fourth and fifth. And this picture here of a king, that's Christ. Christ the king. What else? Oh, uh, let's see. That is a gold and silver portrait bust of Charlemagne. It's made of silver, you see the silvery parts, and gold, you see the gold parts. And his crown has many jewels and gems and that archy thing on it. Of course, that's a symbolic representation. Now here, what do you think's going on here? <laughs> yes, when did that happen? When it pissed them off. Dan. <laughs> A little Sorry. too free, thank you. Who's this on the horse? <gasps> That's King Carl, Charlemagne. And who are these people here, bound and chained? Uh, people, slaves. Saxons. Yeah, thank you, Chase. She said it first, but I was thank looking you. for the word. I didn't remember. Saxons! I knew I had. I was on the so, what tree is this? The Holy Oak. The Holy Oak of the Saxons. And Charlemagne is ordering its destruction. No, don't destroy our god. It's not nice. Ha <laughs> ha. He's not a god. He's just a big sprout. And I hate sprouts. So, there, there is Charlemagne. Now, I am going to play something amusing for you about books in the Middle Ages just because I think it's funny. And then after that, we will go into um, discussion. So that's it for today at home. Thank you. Remember, watch the video tomorrow. Get it all done and make a comment before 2 p.m.